I love the imagery of the Lord coming back, just riding on the clouds. I mean, it's going to be a great thing when the Lord comes. Amen. I believe the Lord could come at any time. Do you? I really do. I've asked Marty if he comes back today, if he'd finish my sermon for me, I'd appreciate it. Oh, that was terrible. That was terrible. We're starting a new series today uh, called The Names of God or God's Names. And one of the incredible things about the Bible is when you begin to explore the names of God in the Bible, you'll see there are many different facets of the diamond of God that he wants to show us about himself. And the title of the message this morning is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Aren't you thankful this morning for God's provision? The Lord who provides. In Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse uh, 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Have you ever thought, I wonder if God's testing me? <laughs> he does test us from time to time, doesn't he? So he tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place that God had told him about. Now I'll stop right there. You know the story. He's about to sacrifice his son. Can you imagine God asking you to do something like that? But all of this is a type of what God did for us, right? So he asked him to sacrifice his only son. It, it, it emphasizes there your only son, the son whom you love very much. And I want you to take him to a certain place, and then you're going to sacrifice him. And so he did as he was instructed to do by God. And just before he sacrifices his only son, God provides for him. God answers the prayer. And he says, I provided for you a lamb, so you don't have to sacrifice your son. What a beautiful picture of what God has done for every one of us, where he sacrificed his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for us, for you and for me. What a wonderful God we serve, the God who provides. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I pray that we'll be more grateful than ever for the way you provide for us. In so many different ways, only heaven will be able to tell what you've done for us. And I pray that you bless us this morning as we study your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, one of the things that is an absolute joy to a parent if you love your kids is to provide for them. Don't you love providing for your kids? And we give them shelter, and we give them food, and we give them drink, and we give them clothing, and we give them everything that we might call basic necessities to provide for them. And we love to do that. And then sometimes we even give them something that they don't really need, but they want. Did you ever ask your parents for something that you wanted, you didn't really need it, but you wanted it? I mean, I remember asking my mother for two or three years in a row that I wanted a mini bike for Christmas. I think I was 10, 11, and 12. And I, every year I said, I want a mini bike for Christmas. That's what I want. Uh, and many of you might be asking, what's a mini bike? You know, it's basically a lawnmower engine with a frame around it. It's really very safe. <laughs> and my mom every year would say, Mark, I'm not getting you a mini bike, you know, but I would just pray and say, God, would you let me have a mini bike in the name of Jesus? I pray this, you know. And if you do that, then it has to come through. But you know what? I never got a mini bike. Uh, but you know something about our Lord? He enjoys providing for us. He enjoys blessing us when, in that way. There was a man who uh, decided to give his pastor $1,000. What a wonderful man. But he didn't want to give it to him all at once. And so you know what he did? He sent anonymously $50 a week to his pastor for several weeks. And every time the pastor would open it up, there'd be $50 in there and a note, and it would say, more to come, more to come, more to come. And the pastor obviously was very excited about that. But then I started thinking about that story, you know, more to come, that phrase, more to come. And I thought, you know, that's exactly what the Lord does for us. The Bible teaches us that he gives us blessing after blessing after blessing. How many of you would agree with me that God has blessed me so much, there are too many to count? 
I mean, there really are. And, and you know one of the things he does? He says, I'll forgive you of your sins if you ask me to, but there's more to come. And God says, I'll give you righteousness, but there's more to come. I'll adopt you into my family, God says, but there's yet more to come. I'll give you grace in your life. But there's more to come. And so every time we're blessed by God, we can rest assured another blessing will follow that one. And time after time and time again, God has blessed us. I mean, he gives us good health. He gives us a mind. He gives us the, the strength and the ability to go out and do what we've got to do to live our life. I mean, how many of you are thankful this morning that you didn't wake up dead? That would have been a tragedy. Some of you, I mean, right now, I mean, if the ambulance just came in, if we said we got somebody dead in the audience, they'd probably haul out four or five of you before they found the right one, you know? Some of you looking a little, a little dead this morning. But anyway, God says, I'm going to give you more and more and more. And that's his nature. God is a, a giving God. That's what he does. Think about it. God could have given us one tree on this planet, and people would have driven and flown for miles and miles to see that one tree. But he gave us untold billions of trees, didn't he? God could have put one star in the sky, just one, to honor his glory. But God put untold billions of stars in the sky. That is a testimony to the fact that God is a luxurious, giving God. He could have put one lake on this whole, in, in the United States of America, put one lake, and I'm sure it would have been Lake Conroe. You know, for his glory, but he gave us thousands and thousands of lakes. God is a good giving God. Do you thank him for that this morning? And he delights, amen. He delights in being our provider, just like a parent delights in providing for their kids, giving them things they need and giving them things that they don't need. And even as a grandparent, isn't that a lot of fun to give your grandkids stuff they don't need? I mean, just to tick their parents off for nothing else. I mean, it's a joy. I want to share with you three things this morning concerning Jehovah Jireh and how wonderful he is, the, the Lord who provides. First of all, God guarantees us his provision. Now, if God guarantees it, it's not like some of the guarantees we get when we buy stuff and we find out there's a little caveat in that guarantee. Oh, well, that's the one thing that's not guaranteed. And it's always the one thing that breaks on something I buy. Are you with me? But when God says, I guarantee you my provision, you can count it and chalk it down. He is going to provide because God never breaks a promise. But you know the greatest provision he ever gave us is he guarantees us and gives us his salvation if we ask for it. What a wonderful gift. Genesis 22 verse 8 says, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. Verse 14 and Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh or Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, that is the ultimate provision. There's no greater gift that you could ever be given than the gift of God's salvation. And God says, if you'll repent of your sin, if you will trust me as Lord and Savior, if you believe that I died on a cross for you, then I will come into your heart and I will forgive you of all your sins and I will save you. Now, how many of you this morning are thankful for God's salvation in your life? I mean, it's a wonderful thing. Listen, you can have the whole world. You can become a gazillionaire if you wanted to. Is that a real word? I mean, you could have all the money this world has to offer. You could have power and fame and prestige and all this stuff. You could have nice cars and a mansion to live in. I mean, all kinds of stuff. But if you don't know Jesus, what good is all that stuff? If you lose your salvation, if you gain the whole world, what difference does it make if you've got all that stuff? But here's the problem. We get saved, and then we have all these, I'll call them rats, that enter our life. Distractions. And they begin to vie in our attention. And we don't, we're not as grateful for salvation that, like we used to be. We're not as grateful and thankful for the way God provides for us like we used to. And especially the gift of salvation. And we get these distractions, these rats in our life. There was a pilot one time who heard a rat gnawing on a cable in his plane. 
And he knew if the rat gnawed through that cable, it would make it very difficult, if not impossible, to land that plane. So you know what that pilot didn't do? He didn't put the plane on autopilot and go searching for that rat. That's not what he did. You know what he did? He took the plane higher and higher and higher until it got up to 20,000 feet where the rat would have no oxygen and the rat died. The gnawing stopped. So when the rats of life surround you, you just keep flying higher and higher until you get in the very presence of Jesus. And I'm telling you, he'll take care of all those rats that surround us sometimes in life. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you just fly higher and higher, and you get to him through prayer and searching and seeking and reading his word. And God says, I'll take care of this. God saves us because we can't save ourselves. We can't. We can't save ourselves. No, you say, well, I could because I am really, really good. Well, listen, I'm better than all the rest of you, and I can't save myself. I'm just kidding. Of course I'm not. I'm the chief of sinners. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. She'll tell you. But none of us can save ourselves, so we need a Savior. And God says, I provided a Savior for you like I provided the sheep in the bush for Abraham. And so he didn't have to sacrifice his son. I provided for you. There's something else I see here. God gives us the necessities of life. He gives us the necessities of life. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. This is why I tell you not to worry about everlasting life or everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Is it life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Anybody here ever struggle with worrying? If you struggle with worrying from time to time, would you raise your hand? If you do it a whole lot, would you raise both hands? (laughs) How many of you would say, if I've got nothing to worry about, it worries me? (laughs) I mean, and the Bible asks the question, can you add one moment to your life by worrying about things? Now, God says, I'm going to provide for your basic needs. That means he's going to give us food and drink and clothing and shelter. How many of you got something you're going to, you plan on eating after we get out of church today? Anybody? You plan on drinking something. Amen. You're going to drink something like Diet Coke or water or tea. Right? Aren't you thankful this morning you got clothes to wear? I'm glad you're not sitting out there naked. Look at the person next to you. Just imagine what they'd be like if God hadn't given them clothes. You got a home to go to? Amen? I mean, we're blessed, aren't we? I I promise you, when you leave this morning, if you drive under a bridge on your way out, you're you're probably going to see somebody. That's where they live, out under a bridge. Most of us, I, I would say probably all of us, get to go to a home. We've got a shelter. God has blessed us in more ways than we could possibly imagine. And the Bible says right here, he takes care of the lesser things, the birds of the air, the animals in the forest. And then he goes on to say, and you are more valuable than than those things are to God. God made you. God created you. And something else, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. You are his creation. And he's going to take care of you. You remember the old song that came out in the 70s? It was sung by, I think, a Jamaican guy, and he said, don't worry, be happy. That was my best Jamaican impersonation. I apologize, all right? Over and over, he says, don't worry, be happy. Now, let me tell you what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that you don't have to work. It doesn't mean that, well, you know, God will provide for me. The Bible says he'll provide for me, and so I just don't have to work. I can just do what I want to when I want to, and, and, you know, God's going to provide for me. That's not what it means, and the Bible covers this. It says in the Bible, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. So God says, I want you to work. Part of God's provision for us is giving us the mind and the physical ability to work. Do you like to work? Yesterday, I spent the whole day because my wife got this genius idea. She said, I want the carpet off the stairs, and I want you to put stair treads down. And I said, yes, ma'am. So I've been peeling off the carpet, 
And then I go out there and I cut out the wood. And, and my stairs aren't straight. It's not like straight up and down. they got a little bit of a curve to them, so there are no two treads alike. And I had to work so hard yesterday. Everybody said, oh, pastor. I mean, you know. But work is a joy. What if you, what if you didn't have the ability to work? Would you miss it? If you didn't have the ability to produce, if you didn't have the mind that God has given you that you could even think to do things. See, God created us where we find fulfillment in doing things and getting things done and working. That's how God has blessed us. Let me tell you, it'll be a great day of rejoicing when I get those stairs finished. I mean, I'll look up at those stairs and think, Mark, you are quite a carpenter. And I think, you know, doing carpentry is a good thing. My boss, after all, was a carpenter. You know? So it's a good thing to work and produce and create things. And God says, I, that's why I created you the way I did. There's a second thing I see here, God's provision and priorities. God's provision and priorities. Now, here's something I know about God. I can be 100% confident in God. Absolutely 100% confident in God. It goes on to say in Matthew 6, verse 28. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? Now, here's, here's the punchline of this passage right here. Verse 32. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, the lost. They're the ones that worry about those things. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. So the Bible's saying don't worry about today. Now, that doesn't mean don't plan for the future. We need to plan for a future. But we don't have to worry about today. And it's saying right here, the plants produce flowers. And what do they do? They yield seeds. That produces more flowers. And the birds build nests for their young. But I can't imagine going up to any bird anywhere at any time and saying, Mr. Bird or Mrs. Bird, are you worried about your future? Would you like to buy an insurance policy? And I can't imagine a little blue jay saying, well, yeah, I've been, I've been really fretting over this. You, you didn't know I could speak bird, did you? He says, those birds don't worry about it. And then he asks the question, why should you? And worry causes a lot of problems. Did you know that? Physical problems. Not just emotional problems. But they tell us that worry can cause not only discouragement, but ulcers. Ulcers, fear, tension, a lack of security, or rather insecurity in your life. Worry is a bad thing. It, it's like a cancer that gets in us and it eats away. And Matthew chapter 6, verse 27 says, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? You can't add one moment to your life by worrying about things. Have you ever worried about something and it didn't happen? And you think, if I hadn't worried about it, it might have happened. We begin to play these mind games with ourselves, don't we? The Bible says don't do that. It'll take away from your life. It won't add to it. And then we've got to put God first. Putting God first. In Matthew 6, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Put God first and not yourself first. That means I'm going to serve God even if I don't feel like serving God. I'm going to get up and come and worship God even if I don't feel like worshiping God. I'm going to serve the Lord and I'm going to be faithful to Him instead of just being comfortable and worrying about my own comfort. I'm going to serve the Lord. Now here's the principle. When we put God first, He puts us first. Did you catch that? Listen again. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. There's the caveat, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. When we put God first, he puts us first. Now, all the stuff that we have, no matter what you name, you've got because of God. I mean, it's a blessing, but that's why you've got it. Augustine once wrote this, God is more anxious to bestow his blessings on us than we are to receive them. God desires to bless. Can you imagine going to heaven one day, standing before the Lord, and the Lord saying, you know, I wanted to give you so much more, 
but you just didn't ask. I wanted to bless you more than I did, but you just had so many doubts you just didn't trust me. And we miss out on the blessings of God because we don't trust him and we choose to worry instead of following him. Here's the third thing. God answers our prayers. God answers our prayers. Now, if any of you have been praying about something or for something for a long time and God just hasn't answered that prayer yet, would you raise your hand up real high? I mean, I, there are many things I pray about. And I think, okay, God, sometimes because we're human, we wonder, where are you, God? Are you not listening to me? Have you forgotten me? Does this not matter to you? So the principle here is you don't give up no matter what. You don't give up. It says in Luke chapter 18, one day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people. That's the kind of person you want as a judge, right? Somebody who doesn't fear God and doesn't care about people. But this woman is driving me crazy. Any of you men ever had a woman? Oh, I better not ask that. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant request. Now, there was a Jewish concept that taught this. Don't pray more than three times a day. Because if you pray more than three times a day, it makes God weary. And so that's what Jesus was uh, addressing when he was teaching the flaw in that kind of theology. And Jesus said, don't worry about praying more than three times a day. He said, you go to God and you pray repeatedly and persistently, and you pray until the Lord answers the prayer. That's what he's saying. Now, here's this woman that she wants justice. Can you imagine the judge, you know, gets out of his Mercedes, and there's that lady saying, hey, judge. That's a joke. They didn't have Mercedes back then. He gets his phone, and there's a text message from her and a voicemail from her. He's getting an email from her. That's kind of the modernized way to look at it. Every time she gets a chance to draw his attention to herself, saying, listen, judge, you've got to do something about this. And finally, he said, I'm not going to respond to her because I want to, but I'm going to respond to her because she's driving me nuts. So the emphasis here is that it's all right to go to God repeatedly. It's not a bad thing to ask him for the same things over and over. Now, so why would God have us pray like that? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. I was going to dismiss you early, but since you asked, all right? One of the ways that God would have us, one of the reasons God would have us repeatedly come to him with a prayer is to develop our spiritual muscles. Now, what if you went to God and every time you went to God, like I did when I was a boy, God, I want a mini bike. God says, it's in your garage. God, I want a million dollars. Check your bank account. It's in there. God, I want a new house. Go over here on this street. Just got you one. Do you think you would develop very much as spiritually if, if God granted you everything that you wanted every time you asked for it? You know that Garth Brooks song, I thank God. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers because he wanted to marry the high school sweetheart and all that stuff. He goes to a football, uh, you know, what do you call that? Homecoming. Goes to a football homecoming and he sees her. And then he writes that song, sometimes I thank God. She must look like a warthog is all I can figure. You know? So sometimes God doesn't answer prayers the way we want it because it's not what's best for us. Amen? L listen, if God doesn't answer your prayer the way you want to, it's because his plan is better than yours. So sometimes he puts it off for us to develop spiritual muscles and then to develop a burden for whatever it is we're really praying about. The more we pray about it, the greater our burden will be. And then sometimes God might do it. He might put it off to test our sincerity. You know, if I ask God one time and I never ask him again, was it really all that important to me? I mean, was it something that really mattered? If I just ask one time and I never think about it again and I never ask for it again. So sometimes God might say, I'm going to test your resolve. I'm going to test your sincerity, whether it's something that's really a burden on your heart or not. And then something else, God might delay in answering prayers because you're going to appreciate the answer more when he finally does come through. Amen. I mean, when, when you prayed about it and it's a burden on your heart, 
And then God finally answers the prayer. I mean, you just want to rejoice, amen? I remember when I was pastoring at Hopewell, there was a man that, in the choir. Uh, his name was Le- Leon. And Leon had two twin boys. They were grown men, but they were lost as they could be. And Leon was one of the most godly people I've ever known in my life. And we had a high attendance uh, day one Sunday morning. And, I mean, the little building was packed. And uh, Leon got his boys to come to church. And during the invitation, the boys started walking down the aisle. He'd been praying for them for years. They're young men. And he'd been praying for years. And both of them came together to, to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I'll never forget the shout I heard from the choir loft when Leon saw his boys coming to get saved. What a, what a wonderful thing. When God finally comes through, we appreciate it more. Or maybe the timing is not right. You know, God is putting it off because he's orchestrating things behind the scenes. So that when, when everything is revealed, you'll see, you'll look back and say, oh, I see now that God was just orchestrating things so that everything would be right when it came around. Something else I say, we have to follow God's path. In Luke chapter 18, verse 6. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he re- rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his people who cry out to him day and night while uh, will he keep putting them off? Don't you think God's going to come through if this unjust, ungodly, mean-spirited judge will finally come through? And then we go to God who is good. Do you agree that God is good? Isn't he going to come through for us? So our persistence shows our heart and then God answers in his time have you ever tried to talk to god about his timing i mean you ever just sat down with god and said god listen here <laughs> you are way behind the eight ball on this you should have had this done last week you ever done that god does things in his time and not our time his ways are not our ways croft pence wrote When we worry, it's because we believe more in our problems than in the promises of God. Wow. When we worry, it's because I believe more in my problems than I do in God's promises. Well, let God mature you. Let God grow you. And when I'm talking about you, I mean me too. We're all in this together, right? We're all on this same pathway, this same journey together and growing and maturing as we walk with the Lord. And I learned things today I didn't know yesterday or last week or last month. And God is just constantly teaching us. But here's one thing I've learned about God. He is indeed Jehovah Jireh. He is the God 